God as we enter into your presence this morning. We ask you for forgiveness for our sins and our shortcomings. We come with thanksgiving, God, to honor and worship you. We glorify your majestic name. We magnify your name, God. We lift your name on high, God, because we know that you deserve it. And so, God, we ask you to accept our joint sacrifice of praise and worship unto you today. We are grateful, God, that you have brought us together in peace and worship with the Scottsdale Baptist Church at such a time as this. God, we are grateful for this friendship and the unity of love. We thank you, God, that not even chaos upon chaos, God, will separate and keep us from worshiping you in unity and in love. God, we bring our nation and the world before you. You see and know all things. So, God, we place all our issues and our concerns at your feet. Your word reminds us, God, that if we, your people, who are called by your name, will humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways, that you will forgive our sins and heal our land. God, indeed, our land is in need of healing. So please, God, hear and answer our prayer. And God, we pray that the peace will prevail even in the midst of chaos. Not the peace of man, God, but the peace that you give God, that peace that passes all understanding to humankind, that even in the midst of this storm, God, that we will not lose focus on the purpose of Christmas. We thank you, God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, as we come to you. Amen.
spirit to be in our midst as our churches come together to share the love between us and to celebrate the blessing of our oneness. Hear our prayers and receive the honor that is due to your name. Create in us clean hearts and mold us in your image. Hear the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Then is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
in this joint worship experience. The Trinity Baptist Church uh, is very active uh, at this time. All of you follow us weekly. We have many, many ministries which occur weekly. Uh, one of our biggest highlight moments has been our Peter Grill. Uh, this week we had our shelter uh, person come in. And on this week we're going to highlight one of our own, uh, Aaron Rock, who is going to talk uh, about the story and his love for jazz. And he's actually going to play some of the jazz music on Thursday night at 8 o'clock. Uh, also, your pastor was involved in the, in, with the international uh, healing the trauma of racism this weekend. It was phenomenal. I was talking to people all over the world, Brazil, China, Australia, and if any of you would like to see and hear what your pastor is doing, I can certainly send you the information. It was a very, very uh, historical moment for your pastor on Friday night as we had people from all over the world who are talking about racial justice. There will be a uh, social gathering here in Brooklyn today. This is one of the reasons I am sitting in my office. Hallelujah. My office, I miss it. I haven't been in my office for quite a while. And so at 2 o'clock today, for those of you who live close to the Restoration Plaza, there will be a gathering of Brooklyn pastors who have come together. And I am a part of that. Dr. Lacey from Bethany. And we feel a need to organize a peaceful uh, gathering at GM, of course, uh, you wear your mask and all of your gear to protect ourselves from COVID-19. But we will gather at 2 p.m. Restoration Plaza, New York City on Fulton Street. If you are in the area uh, and you want to come, I would encourage you to come. So again, welcome. Thank you, Pastor Bembry. Thank you so much. It's a joy and a privilege to be together, gathering as one church, Garzell Community Baptist and Trinity Baptist of Brooklyn. We are sister churches. We are American Baptist churches. So there's a bond there. There's a bond that the pastors have with one another. And we're hoping today that we can experience some of the bond um, of the congregations that God has called us together um, to unite on, on this day. Uh, what a blessing that is. And I can tell you that uh, the plan was for us to come together. Um, a couple years ago, we began the conversation and a year uh, back in January of 2019, we were set to switch pulpits and we had an ice storm. So we had to cancel that. And so God saw fit to bring us together on this Sunday uh, in the midst of all that's going on in our world, God arranged it so we would be together today. So it is a, a blessing, I think. The worship team, I want to thank um, Deacon Brown. I want to thank Will and Doris for helping on the technical end to make this happen. And of course, um, Pastor Bembry for your hospitality, your love, your graciousness uh, towards me and towards this church. So we are blessed to be together. Um, some announcements. I just want to remind everyone to be prepared for communion that we will share together. A time we will come to the Lord's table together to break bread here in the cup so if you have your elements great you prepared if you need to get them um we'll wait no you you can get them at your own convenience um we are still collecting food here in as far community baptist for the pantry so the non-perishable items that you've been bringing have been great the spaghetti the sauce the diapers i keep it coming thank you very much we continue to make trips down there um weekly sometimes uh, multiple times during the week and I know that Jim at the Fuller Center sends his, his thanks uh, regularly. He was overwhelmed by our last diaper delivery. Uh, discussions are in progress. Just want you to know that we are in progress talking about what we might expect once the church does reopen. We don't expect that this will be for a number of weeks, um, but I want you to know that the church is, is, is having those discussions, is, has ordered materials to make it happen. And so things are in progress and we'll have updates for you shortly. A prayer group will meet this coming Wednesday night just off the parking lot. We'll be together. We'll, we'll uh, bring your own chair and we'll space ourselves out. The talent show is June 18th. It's Friday, June 18th. So your church leadership, we remind you to get your acts together for June 18th's talent show. You should have gotten a letter in the mail. 
and uh, more more to come on that. But you'll want to um, begin rehearsing if your act requires that. Um, just want to remember in prayer today and remind the church to be praying for uh, Miss Daphne. Uh, she's been experiencing a lot of pain lately, and also the Murphy family. Don's um, brother passed away this week, so we want to join our hearts together and remember them as well. Pastor Bembry? Thank you, Pastor Mark. Uh, I would like to extend a welcome, but I'm going to put in the African traditional form. I have a friend, I have a friend, oh, the wrong national person, of the people. I have a friend who is from Canada. He spoke to me one day and he said, if you are American, you're really uh, not deep. That's he said, you're not deep. I'm like, what are you talking about? So in American culture, you you always bend your hand and say, how are you doing? And he said, in our culture in Kenya, we don't say that. When we greet people, we extend our hand and we say, I see you. I see you. That's a powerful image as a way of welcoming people. Say, I see you. So I bring the, the uh, worship format of uh, an African form of greeting. And we want to know that we see each other, uh, and we want you to feel welcome. As the mark is my, we're like tight, tight, tight. We have some deep conversation. I love this brother. He has an open heart. My heart is open, and we work together with great extension with our work with the American Baptist Church. So again, I say welcome to the Scarlettville family. Thank you so much for coming. We are blessed to be able to welcome one another and to have the spirit of our living God uniting us. So churches, I, I hope you can, I know it's virtual. I know it's uh, it's distant. And so we're, we're, we're not ex exchanging germs today. Um, so we've never been safer to, to have this meeting of churches. And yet um, there's been a lot of love expressed and a lot of warmth um, just between the churches. And so from if you could be here, we would roll out the red carpet for you. Now, SCBC knows that's not saying much because we have a red carpet. <laughs> but we welcome you in that regard. We want to, We would give you. We would give you a, a great welcome if you were in our presence, and you know that that's not just in, in a church. That's that's in life. And so when our paths meet, that welcome is going to be warm and has been warm. So uh, we are blessed to know you, and we're, we're grateful for God bringing this relationship together. Thank you, Pastor Mark. And at this time, if it's uh, appropriate for our joint worship service, if both churches at a time, silence, joint Gracious God, we know you hear the prayers. We know you hear the cries for help. And so God, we ask that you hear our prayers. 
and you intercede through our silence when we know not what to pray. May your will be done on this earth. May we be faithful in carrying it out. May we join hands with the oppressed. And Lord, when it's us, we pray that we'd always find you to be our friend, to come alongside us and lift us up. So God, lift us, our souls, and lift our souls up and lift our eyes up to the hills from which comest our help. For we know that today and always we will find you faithful. Be in the lives of the hurting, the despairing, the hopeless, and remind all of us that you are good. Your mercies endure forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was not you that was the 
Good morning. It is good to be in the virtual house of the Lord with my brothers and sisters in Brooklyn and in Westchester. Um, our first reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, and then we have to Galatians after that. Ephesians 4, 1 through 13. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And then Galatians 3, 26 through 28. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading of God's word. Amen. Um, I'd like to present, uh, seeing as we are praising the Holy Spirit, Jesus, Son, and the Father, uh, I think will be appropriate if we could uh, just continue in that spirit, and in that spirit, uh, I'm going to bring you guys a new line, and God is only doing something new, so please allow it to resonate in your heart, in order to go ahead and build up the body.
the white Christian view point of Christianity and many of our slaves in the American context were oppressed because of uh, racial bigotry. So in our tradition, our great tradition as African Americans and Caribbean Americans, uh, we did a we had a massive social protest against white European theology. And most of our black churches uh, which exist today are in the result of the racial tension in American history. So I wanted to use that as a framework because we have we use in American uh, culture the term black church, African American church, and we say that we're saying that we responded as a protest against the white working Christianity. So here we are now in 2020, and we're still grappling with this race issue. I've been I've been with this uh, on a journey of racial justice since the very beginning of my life. I have always tried to grapple with race, and I must confess that when I was younger, I was a very angry black man. I could not talk to a white person. I could not have a friend like Pastor Mark Snyder because I was angry. And it was in my college days that I began to work through my anger. I was a very diligent college student. I was the president of the Black Student Union. I wore my dashiki. I had my afro. I had my bell bottom. And I was going around saying, Stay it loud, black and proud. I remember those moments. I was a very agitational black student leader at the Montclair State University. And um, I remember inviting Stokey Carmichael to our campus to talk. I tried hard to bring black, white students, black students, everybody. I was trying to bring everybody together to talk about the race issue. Why is it not unified? Racially. Why is there so much division? Why is there so much uh, separation? Why, in the words of Dr. King, is Sunday morning still the most segregated time of the week? Why are we uncomfortable embracing racism, different diversity, uh, backgrounds? Why, why are we afraid? And so here we, have, here we are now in 2020. And we have witnessed one of the most awful racial hatred images that we've, we've, we've actually seen them many times. But George Floyd it kind of struck a nerve in all of us. George Floyd's death was traumatic because we see a white police officer with his knee on his neck for 8 minutes 46 seconds. And I have actually tried to be silent for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, and I have discovered that's a long time for a police officer to have his feet uh, on a black man's neck. So it happened, and I've gone through a, a, what I call a myriad of emotions. I have been going through a roller coaster of emotions all week long. Because I am a, a basically an intellectual person, I have tried my best this week to respond in what I call a proactive manner uh, due to the George Floyd situation. Yes, I understand the young people. I am happy that our young people are out there protesting, rightly so, because I am a baby boomer and there's a new generation rising up. So it's beautiful to see the new generation. So, here we are now in a context of Scarlettsdale Community Baptist Church, Trinity Baptist Church. Both churches have their own identities. Pastor Mark and I have been in a lot of uh, back and forth conversation this week. I appreciate Pastor Snyder so much. This Pastor Snyder has an open mind. Both of us have different open minds, and we've been kind of working through this this experience uh, all week long. So. Basically, the impact of racism, of course, has a tremendous impact on everybody. It's not, 
African-American, Caribbean people, persons, of course, it impacted us, but I'm seeing a lot of my white friends who are actually out there now saying we support black lives. So in the midst of this unity life that falls with music, my question is, are we really unified? I, I don't think we are. I have received so many emails this week from some of my white friends who want to talk about racism. And I actually had a, a global Zoom conference on Friday night where I was talking with people from all over the world. And I learned that it has a lot to do with where you're from. I was talking to a Brazilian sociologist. sociologist. He's giving up people racism from Brazil. I hear people in China. The Chinese have been discriminated I hear the Jewish person's perspective. All of this pain seems to go in terms of our identities. So how do we respond? How do we respond with the text of Jesus 4, 113, unity in Christ? So Malcolm X, Martin King says, I have a dream. And Mark Malcolm says, I don't see a dream. I see a nightmare. And I think we are seeing a nightmare. But thank God our young people are giving us a sense of hope that the dream still lives, Pastor Snyder. And I believe you're still a dreamer. So that's my introduction to our sermon for today. Thanks, Pastor Bembry. Thank you so much. As Paul pleads with the church to be united and reminds them that they are, in effect, united. If they claim Jesus Christ as their Lord, if they have communion with God, then they, just by um, the osmosis, and by their uh, relative nature, and through the transfer, uh, transfer, transferring properties of even math, they are united. And so the dream, the dream is God's dream. The dream is God's will. And so Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed in alignment with what God wanted for his people. And so when we see images, I think of some of the images that I've seen this week, um, a white police officer with a black young lady walking down the street. Those, those images should warm our hearts and should give us some bit of comfort and give us some bit of hope. And because we've seen, we've seen the other side and the images get ingrained in our psyche and we need to be listened to, we need to be comforted. Our church is a, a very diverse church and I, it, we, not all of the diversity is represented this morning in our, our broadcast. Uh, we're, very, we're very white this morning. Um, but this doesn't really represent our church. Our church hasn't always been this. Our church was, was once a very white church. With very few people, very few people um, giving us uh, another context from which to see life. And so we have been blessed to have people come from all over the world to, to our church and to minister to us and to teach us some things that we uh, may have been become out of touch with. And so it, it is interesting to talk about race in our church because some folks are are experiencing the, the, the conversation from a much different background. And and so when Martin Luther King Jr. spoke here, and he did in 1960, March 30th, 1960, almost 60 years ago, he spoke to this congregation. He spoke to a white congregation and preached a message of love and a message of unity, a message of desegregation. Um, imagine what that must have been like for that church to, to have him come in. My guess is it was one of their, if it wasn't their first, it was one of their first experiences hearing a different voice, someone with a different complexion in the pulpit. And I think if he came back today, he would see a very different Dale Community Baptist Church one that would warm his heart in some way. One that he, he would have to, to reckon with, is, is this the dream? If he just came here first, he might think that we've arrived in some way. But the reality is, 
The reality is we're far from that. And so even as our churches come together, would that have warmed Dr. King's heart? I think it would have. And like I said, the alignment with God's vision, it also warms God's heart when we can actually display the unity that is inherent within us. God himself is united. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is unity between the Trinity. The one moves and the other, and the other picks up. We never know where one picks up and the other leaves off. It's a very human understanding to understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But our God is very dynamic and always acts as one. We do not worship three gods. We worship one God, united. And so the church needs to operate as one and move as one. And to your point, Pastor Bembry, we have not represented that very much. We have not reached out to the oppressed enough. And we have not come together, different races, in harmony, anywhere near enough. As a matter of fact, in some ways, the culture is leading the church. One of the examples of this is I was very surprised to see occurred, I think it was Monday evening on the Manhattan Bridge, when there was a protest, and those protesters were moving towards Manhattan, and they were blocked by police, so they came back to Brooklyn, and so there were reporters there on the ground in Brooklyn as they were crossing into the city, uh, into the borough, and the camera was on the entire time of this line of people, and so I'm listening to the reporter who's in the foreground, and, and then I, I began to notice behind the reporter the complexion of skin of the protesters. And I don't know what the breakdown was, but it was at least 70% white. Uh, okay, I didn't expect that. When the, the helicopter was overhead the bridge and I could see nothing but specs, my assumption would have been there would be a lot of black folks on that bridge crying out for justice. And so it did encourage me. It encouraged me. And I think this, this, is, this would be an encouragement to our society. But, but these folks aren't necessarily Christians. We don't know what that background from. That would really warm my heart if they were believers out there on the bridge protesting for someone else. Standing up, giving of their time, and crying out for someone else's need. That would be a beautiful a beautiful moment for the church. And so our God is one and we need to act as one. I think about the symbol. It's a, it's a strange symbol maybe, but maybe see if you can track with me. There's a piece of playground equipment that I don't see around anymore. A piece of playground equipment that I don't see around much anymore. I think it may have died off in the 80s or the, maybe the 90s. It's called the seesaw. I don't, see, I don't see them making them anymore, and I think I know why. Because this is the most dangerous piece of playground equipment that at least I've ever been on. And I actually have gone to the hospital from falling on a seesaw. The seesaw requires two people, one on either side, that absolutely must work together. And I think this is why it's been taken out of our society, because we have seen it not work many times, too many times. I wasn't the only person to get hurt on a seesaw. And the classic move on the seesaw is when two people are on it and they get to about midway and one jumps off of the seesaw and leaves the other one crashing down, right? That's the classic maneuver that you have to be careful if you're going to venture onto this amazingly dangerous, hazardous apparatus. <laughs> and so as a people, as a society, we have seen too many times where different people get on the seesaw and just as things about to level off, the one's off and the other crashes. So as parents, 
we can coach our kids on how to behave on a system. But as we grow up, nobody's monitoring us anymore. The truth is, they don't play nice. We don't want things to be even. That's, that's the horrific reality, Pastor Bembry, that you were talking about, that exists outside the church and unfortunately still exists inside the church. We don't like this equilibrium enough to stay on the seesaw. Paul uses a different image, and in his, in his metaphor, it's the body of Christ. It says, with Christ as the head, we are the body. And so we all have different parts, the hand, the arm, the leg, all these different ventricles and cells and veins and ligaments and bones and organs and muscles all work together for a, a common purpose with Jesus as the head. And so just like it is in, in Scarsdale, it's also true in Trinity that you can't have a foot say to the hand, I don't need you. You can't have the stomach say, I'd really like to go have lunch, and the foot say, I'm going to go take a walk. Something's got to give so that the feet can walk the stomach to the refrigerator and you can have your snack as you walk. But it's also true between our churches. Because in God's eyes, there really isn't a trinity and a Scarsdale Community Baptist Church. In God's eyes, it's one body. It's not two bodies. It's one. It's one. And so I don't know what I am. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm the pinky. Pastor Bembry, maybe you're something more formidable. Maybe you're a bicep. But my point is, our churches each have a part of the body represented in their people. And we need one another in order to thrive. And so when the body's hurting, as I've heard from Pastor Bembry today describe his church, as members of our church are hurting, this is a time to come together. This is a, a time to tend the wounds, to stop and to listen so that we can move on with our mission. Healing and unity isn't really the mission. It's just part of the mission. We follow the Great Commission. And that, in that great commission, it is assumed that the church is united to go carry it out. It's assumed that if we're going to go into all the world to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, to baptize in the name of our Lord and to, to, to teach everything that Jesus taught, to make disciples, we don't do that apart. We do that united. We do that as one. The churches, we, we can't make the mistake of, of looking at our different addresses and, and looking at our different sanctuaries and looking at our different styles of worship, our different versions of the scripture, our different favorite hymns and our different internet platforms. We, we can't make the mistake of looking at the differences and thinking that we are in fact different that way. Oh yeah, there, there are a lot of different there's a lot of nuance between us. There's a lot to learn. But it's not about working to be united. It's coming to grips with the fact that if you're in Christ, we already are one. And so we need to wake up to that reality. We're one in Jesus Christ. There's never any such thing as being two, let alone three let alone however many different churches there are. But remember, church, that in God's eyes, one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one Father, one Spirit, one Son, one God, and one church. Paul mentions that we are united for the purpose of mission, 
and that in order to accomplish that mission, we're given gifts. We're given gifts. The church is given gifts. And if we can think of the word gifts as being, well, it could be a nice new house, a nice car, it could be jewelry. That's not the kind of gift. The gifts are roles in the kingdom. Some to be evangelists, some to be prophets, some to be teachers, to equip the saints for service. Service. So we're united in service. So this is true for the church and it's true for our mission. So within the church, we have people that we need to serve. And outside the church, there's a world that needs to serve. Jesus gave the ultimate example of not taking these gifts as something to brag about, something to be superior over others with. Jesus was called the suffering servant. Jesus was the ultimate evangelist, the ultimate pastor, the ultimate teacher, the ultimate equipper of people for ministry, and yet he never held it over them to make the other feel less than. Jesus always came alongside. You remember how he washed the disciples' feet. I don't know of any disciple that was superior to Jesus, to you. And so this is the image of our churches coming together. In order to come together as one, it's not one church that needs to submit to the will of the other. Just like a marriage, and somebody used that analogy this week, just like a marriage, you both need to come in a spirit of service and servant. I want to serve you, Trinity. That's the attitude. That's how this works. If we even have the image of being equal, we're still going to fight for our stuff, and we're still going to want to see things 50-50, and there's a good chance that one of us is going to jump off the seesaw. But if we come in a way similar to Dr. King, what an image for somebody to stay on the seesaw. No matter how many times somebody came over to it, he stayed on and he got dropped many times. That's powerful. That's powerful. Because I know what I'd want to do if somebody dropped me on the seesaw. I'd want to drop them on the seesaw or off the seesaw. What a powerful image that Jesus gives us by not seeing himself as superior and, and, and actually dying to himself in such a way that he goes to a cross to suffer as the suffering servant on our behalf. What an image of service we have. What an image of, of unity with his Lord, with his God, with his Father while he was on this earth, accomplishing the mission of his dad sending the Holy Spirit, all acting in as one, as Paul encourages the church to act as one. And as we implore our churches, not just today and not just with our churches, but with every church, can we see ourselves as one? If so, then maybe God's kingdom really is coming on this earth. Pastor Bembry? Wow. That is the mark. That is the probably one of the most intelligent uh, questions I have heard from one who is white. Uh, because all of my white friends, many of them remain speechless. But you articulated in a very potent manner how you view this unity racial thing from the perspective of a man who has to be white male. So I really appreciate the metaphors you use about the seesaw. I used to do seesaw riding when I was a kid, too, and I used to, all right, one person jumps off, it's a crash landing. So uh, I want to kind of pick up on that theme with you with uh, the great commission of Jesus, where he says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I, I would like to bring a different take from our side, turning down to Brooklyn, who has been a, a, a gentrified community. So our neighborhood is made up of people from all over the world. And I am 
growing up, like I, I, my people, Trinity Baptist is a very loving group of people, but our history has been rooted in, you know, African Caribbean. So here we are now, where we have to find ways to relate to our neighborhood and be open to people who are non caribbean non-African Americans. And I think that will be our challenge uh, of how we play the seesaw. Now, do we want people to come to our church and do it our way, you know, the African Caribbean way, or do we go on the seesaw and adapt to other cultural uh, groups in terms of how they understand the uh, So, it's, I think we're experiencing it from our perspective uh, also how we do the seesaw of adapting to all different races of people. Because our neighborhood is uh, very, very simplified. We have so many buildings that are being developed now in our community, and there will be a lot of different faces of people moving in. So the mission gives us a purpose. So I uh, talked to a friend yesterday who was a pastor here in Brooklyn, and he said something that they kind of like, they said, not to them free. We are being the true church now. He said, I love it. I don't have to sit in my church and argue about what color flower we're going to wear, what, um, what we're going to make for the dinner. We don't have time for that anymore. He said, we are out, we are visibly the church. Amen. That really makes me think that we have fail in terms of being the church in any time. We fail. We have not. And here we are now, and we are forced to move beyond differences of thinking, because our church is loaded with diversity. It's, oh my God, everybody thinks in a different way. And now we don't have to spend a lot of time to hear all of that diversity thinking. We have, we try, but at the same time, we have to act, we have to move. So the whole theme of um, united and facing injustices, that is powerful. And I feel that you are united, but you just gave a very powerful voice about God's oneness. So, you know, I think the image you talked about with the Manhattan Bridge with mostly white protesters, yes, I'm seeing the same thing. There are many white persons, Latino, Asian, who are all supporting it. Call it, you know, Friday night, people from all over the world who are united with uh, our American struggle, people from the UK, everywhere, people are fed up. So, you know, the injustice becomes a powerful word. Dr. King is quoted as saying, injustice against one is an indirectly injustice against all. So, back to the seesaw, if, if our white brothers and sisters are not treating our you know, uh, different races uh, uh, in equal justice manner, then injustice comes out. And you're right, the superiority, superiority comes into the uh, picture. Now, I work in academia, and you know, I'm an African-American adjunct professor, and I, I, I experience so much racism in my context where People don't even realize they are speaking with white privilege. And I'm like, duh. You know that this school is 65% of students of color? And here you are critiquing to me these these black male students or, you know, whatever. Because I hear all this stuff and it really drives me to that. I say back to your seesaw, there's the balance there. People of Sometimes the who are white and academia do not understand the struggles that black students, Latino students, Asian students bring in the fight of education. So when you are an educator and you work with students of color, you have to know how to interact with color. So the injustice piece is powerful, and then the mission part is powerful. The uh, 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 the whole issue of our pain. So I'm going to end with a thought, Pastor. This has been a busy week for me. I am actually a student at an, a very white school.
school here in New Jersey. And they called me on the phone, the president of the school, chairman of the board and trustee board, and said, Pastor Bimbery, we respect you to the utmost. And they asked me to write a response to racial injustice. And I did. And it has gone for the board of trustees. The president has an, adopted my I, my little statement as a way of this white institution uh, facing its own version of racial injustices. So I just want to read a little line from what I wrote. I quoted Billie Holiday in my my writing of, of the, uh, her song "Strange Fruit." Billie Holiday says, "Some of the trees bear strange fruit: blood on the leaves and blood at the root." Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. Here the fruit from the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot, and for the trees to drop. Here is the strange and bitter crop. And then I, then I end my little uh, writing with saying that Martin Luther King Jr. said, that race, race uh, rioting is common because he's, he believes that rioting is, a, is an act of the unheard voices. When people feel they're not being heard, they get tired. They become like Fannie Lou Hammer. They become sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so that's how the riots started. It started in the, in the 60s. There were riots all over the place. 2020, we're seeing peaceful protesting. But I believe all of this protesting is for the fight of injustice. Unfortunately, when we fight against injustice, it's not pretty. You've got to, you know, Frederick Douglass is quoted as saying, uh, I agitate, I agitate, I agitate. So when we fight for justice, we have to be very agitational. Uh, so I think this is what's happening with the new generation of young people. And I'm so proud of that, Pastor Mark. And I really am proud of you. Uh, your your statement. So, um, I I finished now my version. Thank you, Pastor Bembry. Do you want to share in an invitation to discipleship before we move on to the corporate reading? Um, we're going to read a, 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 a reading together. Um, hearing the words Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, we are reminded that we are to make every effort to keep ourselves united in the spirit through the bond of peace. Our churches are united through the unbreakable bonds of the very spirit of God. As they lead us in this congregational reading, I invite you to respond to each statement with these words. Unite us in your spirit. So every time I make a statement, you're going to say, unite us in your spirit. Okay? Here we go. When we are tempted to take sides rather than work together, unite us in your spirit. When we are tempted to hold grudges, unite us in your spirit. 
when we struggle with gossip, unite us with your spirit. When we would rather complain, unite us in your spirit. Teach us to be gracious, unite us in your spirit. To make every effort to keep ourselves united in the spirit with a bond of peace, unite us in your spirit. As we join together in Holy Communion, we're reminded of that night on which Jesus was betrayed, when he took bread and broke it, representing his body broken on behalf of all. He took the cup and he blessed it, the cup representing his shed blood, shed for the whole world for the remission of sin. And so today, as we come together at the table, like we've already read and we've already shared, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there's no slave, there's no free. We come together to a table which all are embraced, all are made in the image of God, and all are invited to come, share, the broken body and the shed blood of our Jesus Christ. We are united. This is one table. We share one body. We share in one blood. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it and he passed it to his disciples. In just a moment we will share in the bread partaking as one. So as one church, we partake in the one body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's eat in remembrance of him. Malcolm X, 
Malcolm X is quoted as saying, light brings love. The love brings understanding. Understanding brings patience. And patience brings mark unity. Those are, those are the words of Malcolm X, the image of light. So we must let our light shine in this very dark moment of history and we'll work together for the spirit of oneness and unification of our churches. Thank you so much, Pastor Snyder. Thank you, Pastor Benbury. Thank you for this opportunity to come together as one church. And thank you for your heart. Thank you for your transparency with, with the church, with your own people. Uh, I want to thank Trinity for loving you through a difficult time this last year. I think your church needs to hear that, um, that they've made a difference in my life for how they've ministered to you. I confess to you that I've been a lousy friend this last year. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that there's been a church that's, that's picked you up. And, uh, and, and helped you get to a place where you could be this kind of a blessing on a day like today. As we close in prayer, just want to, you can join together with me in the, the chorus of that hymn, we are, we are One in the Spirit. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We are one. We are one, made in the image of God. Our hearts beat as one. Our spirits beat as one. Let us proclaim to the nations. Let us proclaim to our churches. Let us proclaim to our families that there is nothing that will separate us from the love of God, and from the bond of peace we have through his spirit. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church. Amen.
serve the Lord. The voice of Baal is that singing from Switzerland in 1963. So we end with our voice. Thank you, Pastor Mark, again. And we go now to play it to justice. There will be a large gathering here in Brooklyn at 2 o'clock at the Restoration Plaza. I will be there to dine with all pastors here in Brooklyn as we lead people in a peaceful manner for the work of social justice. Okay. Pastor Bembry, is there is there room for a pastor in your march today? I think church is going to continue in Brooklyn today. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll see you later. Okay, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Mark. That was a powerful, powerful word. Very encouraging. And I have a lot to hold on to charity for the rest of, you know, this week. And uh, thank you. Well, thank, you. thank you. It's been a blessing to take part. The blessing's thank been you. ours for sure. Oh man! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! That'll be fabulous. Wow! That's that. That'll be an honor for sure. I'm making sure I don't miss church that Sunday. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, it's been a blessing. It's very powerful. You too. God bless you. Bye-bye.